May I speak in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Six times in my ordained ministry of 43 years, I have had to deliver farewell messages to the saints of God I have served, and I can tell you it's not an easy thing to do. I may not have succeeded, but my purpose was always to prepare them for the future. This included warning as well as instruction. A new servant leader would arrive, and they would enter into a new phase of ministry. And I wanted them to be at their best. When I retired as Archbishop of York because of COVID-19, that farewell never happened. I had to go into the minster alone and lay down my crozier as Archbishop. Privately, of course, I was also burdened by who my successor would be, a concern most clergy have as they prepare to move on. Uh, please rest assured your time will come too. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I don't know, but it will come. So St. John's Gospel, chapters 13 to 17, is our Lord's farewell message to his beloved disciples. And the crescendo is his intercessory prayer in chapter 17. For them and for us who were far off, but have been brought near by the shedding of his blood. Our Lord <coughs> already knew who his successor would be, one like himself, the Holy Spirit, the Father was to send in his name after our Lord had been glorified, according to John 14, 26. Lord, have mercy if we long for our successors to be like us. The good thing is, science now tells us that each one of us has our own DNA which doesn't belong to anybody else. So never assume that you know who your successor is. And some, yes, yeah, some members of congregations longing for past vicars or rectors instead of welcoming the new and behaving like the Church of England, which has been described as always moving forward by looking backwards and forever captivated by the rear view mirror. No. But also in passing, other farewell messages in the Bible were delivered by Moses in Deuteronomy chapters 31 to 33. So you could go and read and see what we said there. Joshua, uh, in Joshua chapter 23 to 24. And of course, St. Paul in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 20. However, Jesus of Nazareth added a significant prophetic and symbolic action to his farewell message when he washed his 12 disciples' feet. It was an object lesson they would never forget, and nor should we. In our gospel reading from John chapter 13, there is a special message, a spiritual truth to help us in our own Christian journey and discipleships in Christ. At the outset, we are told what our Lord and Master knew, that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father, having given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. This he knew, John 13, verses 1 and 3. We're also told what he did. He got up from the table, took of his outer robe and tied a towel around himself, poured water into a basin and began to worship their feet and wiped them with a towel that was tied around him. 
John 13, verses 4 and 5. The Father had put all things into his hands, yet Jesus picked up a towel and basin. Jesus of Nazareth is down to earth in his humility, was not born of poverty, but out of riches. He was rich, yet he became poor, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He kneels at the feet of his 12 disciples as a slave and washes their feet and dries them. And please remember, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, his feet too were washed. In this simple action of love, Jesus of Nazareth reveals the face of God's hospitality and a new and living way for us to exercise authority and to bring people to him and become his friends. This is the way of down-to-earthiness, humility, and service. As my Baganda tribe proverbs say, and I quote, the fuller, the bigger, the more mature the bunch of banana is, the lower it bends. Secondly, when a tiny toe is hurting, the whole body stoops down to attend to that tiny toe. Now, that's the mark of humility. Please, I want you now to bend down to your little toe. Please, can you do that for me? You're all stooping down. And that is your position in the church. Not high, not mighty, because there are a lot of people who are hurting and we need to be people who stoop down to help them. Friends, you don't have to stay there all the time. You can get up. I nice to have some obedient people in the church. <laughs> you see, the prologue of St. John shows us a descending son of God who became flesh to take us into the presence of his father and our father, his God, and our God. Jesus taking upon himself our humanity, was that you and I may be raised to the heights of glory. And even today in heaven, Jesus still bears the marks of his crucifixion. John 20, verse 17. With incarnation, the all-powerful one, the one through whom all things were made, of John chapter 1, verse 3, becomes the little, the powerless one. First of all, at birth, as a refugee in Egypt, walking with men and women for a good three years, and finally hanging on the cross. And this is the one by whom and through whom all things were made. He's totally dependent on his mother and his adopting father, Joseph. And in his adulthood and ministry, on his friends, and now we see Jesus descending to his knees to worship, to wash the feet of his 12 disciples. As I said before, if you want to ascend, we too must descend to be on our knees. Jesus of Nazareth was the Lord of all creation yet he took the place of a slave, of a servant. He had all things in his hands, yet picked up a basin and a towel. He was Lord and Master, yet he served his disciples as a servant. Humility down to earthiness is not thinking less of yourself. It is simply not thinking of yourself at all. And it is not the same thing as being polite. True humility grows out of intimate relationship with our servant and master, Jesus Christ. If our desire and delight is to know and do our Father's will, as it is in heaven, so that we might glorify his name, then we will experience the joy of following Jesus Christ's example 
of being down to earth, humility, and serve others. The Latin word for humility is the same as earth. So if you want to remember when humility is required, just be a little bit of earth. After all, if you do remember that on Ash Wednesday there was, uh, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, beloved in Christ, we today, just like the 12 disciples that night in the upper room, desperately need this lesson of humility, being down to earth. The church, the body of Christ, is filled with a worldly spirit sometimes of competition and criticism. As followers of Jesus Christ, the servant Lord, vibe with one another to see who is the greatest. We are growing in knowledge. The question is, are we growing in grace, as 1, 2 Peter 3.18 asks of us? Humility is the only soil in which the graces of the Holy Spirit take root. The lack of humility, lack of being down to earth, is a sufficient explanation of every defect and failure in the body of Christ, the church. Jesus of Nazareth served his 12 disciples because of humility and because of his love. In the upper room, Jesus of Nazareth ministered in love to his own disciples, and they received him and what he had to say. Now, the Greek text says this, and I translate, he loved them to the uttermost. He loved them to the uttermost, chapter 13, verse 1. And he still does. And of course, his ultimate expression of humility was his death on the cross, laying down his life for his friends of John 15, 13. The history of our human race changed since the Son of God knelt humbly at our feet, begging our love and making us part of him by cleansing us. And died on the cross to make us righteous and rose again to make us holy. We may accept this or refuse. If you say, yes, Lord, cleanse me, and I prefer your translation, instead of thoroughly, it is throughly. I mean, it's right, right through. Cleanse me throughly, not thoroughly. Then I, you will experience being part of our Lord. And then as models of forgiveness, we will go and love others into his holiness. All our love for others is that they may grow in holiness to be like Christ. If you know this, blessed are you if you do it, John of 14, 17. A really great follower of Jesus Christ is a disciple who makes others feel great. And Jesus did this with his 12 disciples by showing them how to serve and how to love. How true it is that we need Christian leaders who will serve and servants who will lead showing humbleness, holiness, and joyfulness. Submitting to Jesus Christ, who cleanses our lives daily, and then serves us others. And like Jesus of Nazareth, taking the place of a person at the bottom, the last place, the place of a slave. This is the way to live a Jesus Christ shaped life, and always staying close to our Lord and Master in the power of the Holy Spirit. We will then become like him, and our hearts, overflowing with his love, will transmit his love as we participate in the abundance of the joy of Jesus Christ, plenteously shared abroad in our hearts. This God who created this amazing spans of the universe has the same, same amount of love. He longs to pour in each of our hearts. 
of John 17, 13 and Romans 5, 5. He has plenteously shed abroad in our hearts his love, his spirit. So, beloved, let us do it. Let us do it now. Let this be our prayer. Wash us, Lord, for we long to be part of you, to serve one another. Wash the feet of our neighbors, neighborhoods, our nations, your world. Lord, cleanse us and fill us afresh with your love, your joy, your spirit. Amen.